the first topic. <clears throat> so this afternoon, we're going to be um, talking about some elements of um, data science, um, but uh, but trying to um, to to reflect on the fact that data science um, is is a grouping term that actually involves a diversity of types of issues, from infrastructures to methods. Um, um, has relationship to machine learning and, and big data, um, AI. Um, I want to see if I can help sort out the relationship of many of those terms, while at the same time giving you some more concrete sense when we talk about machine learning or when we talk about AI, when we talk about big data, um, what do we really mean? Um, these topics will be of considerable significance when we speak about their relationship to, to dynamic modeling and the coming together of system science and data science. So um, we're going to spend the afternoon building up some familiarity conceptually and some concrete tasks with, uh, with components having to do with this broad space of, of data science. Uh, now, in order to do this, um, as before, I'm going to draw on a set of slides, and then we'll have some interactive components uh, as well. Um, the first set of slides that I'll be, uh, that I'll be drawing on are the ones that sort of situate some broad terms often used as buzzwords in a landscape um, of, of modern data science, an evolving landscape, uh, but when where broad features are often conserved over time. So uh, you'll find these slides currently posted, um, but they're going to introduce uh, terms and ideas we'll be drawing on uh, throughout the boot camp. So I noted in my morning session these two very different computationally and mathematically rooted traditions off pursued in isolation. Um, uh, pursued richly, pursued in depth, but, but often pursued in, in ways that are, if not oblivious to the other, at least not not consciously reaching out for opportunities to collaborate. And sometimes they just seem to pass like ships in the night. Um, uh, we had talked about the different perspectives here with, uh, with methods within data science, particularly paying attention to, to observations from the world and drawing insight from those observations. Uh, insights that will often aspire ultimately to give us understanding of the underlying systems that give rise. And as we'll see, there's this emerging field, uh, very exciting of, of causal AI, which, um, which starts to reach out like uh, causal statistical methods, um, such as the, through the work of Judea Pearl and others, towards this philosophy of, of system science, of of characterizing causal structure of systems in the world. But it does so by, by um, drawing heavily on data to, to inform our understanding of those structures. And in some cases, trying to deduce those structures from that data. System science, by contrast, often is building on theory and, and understanding the degree to which theory is consistent with, uh, has fidelity to this data and using that to refine the, the theory. Um, you know, if, if I were asked to, to, to diagram out relationship of a lot of these um, factors we'll be dealing with in this boot camp to the other, I'll draw a diagram like this, as I did last summer. Um, and um, I wanna come back to this diagram at several points in this talk, and probably throughout this boot camp, 
to emphasize um, a set of relationships. So um, on this diagram at once, we have a uh, data science. Um, we have machine learning and AI. Uh, you'll notice that those overlap with data science, but are not totally, um, in, totally included within it. Um, and we have big data, uh, which is analyzed by and, and managed and visualized and processed um, um, by, by data science tools. We have system science and, and dynamic modeling, which in my mind, um, certainly overlap with data science techniques can and can overlap with machine learning techniques, uh, but are also not uh, totally included of, they're not purely of data science. Um, we're gonna come back to these methods, particularly the relationship between data science here, big data, machine learning, and AI um, to, to explore this. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna do so with a particular nod to health disparities issues, which um, are, are very important in my work and which um, uh, play a, a big, big role in leading to contemporary critique of, of data science, machine learning, and AI approaches. Um, so we're going to start with AI. When, you know, what is AI? When I, uh, when I was an undergrad um, in the late 80s, um, um, the conception of AI um, was rather different. Uh, we were still in the, um, the AI heyday of, of the late 80s, and I was located near AI Alley and uh, Kendall Square at, at, in, um, in, in Cambridge. And um, at MIT, there was a lot of thinking about, um, um, about AI uh, being a technique that could uh, solve problems writ large and, and support uh, you know, flexible uh, reasoning about a wide variety of spheres. This was the time frame of the founding of the Psych Project, CYC, and, and um, a lot of uh, bubbling um, enthusiasm for the potential for general AI. But AI um, has since then um, uh, focused a lot on sort of AI um, in the smaller or, or more modest uh, goals. And broadly, we might characterize AI as, as using computational methods to solve problems traditionally requiring national intelligence. Um, when AI started up, um, it, it wasn't clear that, you know, all the broad outlines of it, but since then it's been distinguished into a set of subfields. Um, and many of these subfields are relevant to this boot camp. Some are less so. Um, um, you know, some divided up into to learning, reasoning, interacting, understanding, knowledge capture. Um, uh, a finer grain characterization would would distinguish, for example, um, human and language communication and engaging in that um, from robotics interacting with an, in a, an environment of these situated actors. Um, uh, uh, performing data fusion, uh, developing theories, um, automating reasoning, etc. And and there are some pundits who have commented somewhat sympathetically that uh, AI is defined to be whatever task hasn't been automated yet. Because the truth is, in the decades since the late '80s, uh, when I first took took my first AI course. Um, uh, you know, there's been huge progress in solving many tasks that um, traditionally were viewed as the sphere of AI at that time. Um, you know, recognition of objects from video or recognition of handwriting and, and reading scrawls, uh, even as bad as, as my own. Um, you know, reasoning about, um, uh, about human language communication and translating from one language reasonably well into another, um, uh, parsing complex sentences and, and different languages. I mean, there's amazing progress that, that's been obtained. And to a certain degree, the goalposts of AI have, have evolved over time. Um, but however you, you dice it, machine learning recurrently comes back as a, as a very important element of AI. And one that 
turns out to be used by many other spheres of AI that are less close, whether it's spoken language recognition or robotics, um, fast things having to do with automated reasoning or planning, all of them could, may make use, and in some cases, almost ubiquitously make use of machine learning. Um, so we're gonna dive into machine learning in a little bit more detail as, as a component that's used by these areas of AI less directly germane to this boot camp, but which is itself machine learning of central interest to this boot camp. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, so we'll go into AI, but first, or sorry, to machine learning, but first I wanna talk about uh, big data, which serves as a, a key um, source of, of insight for machine learning, key focus of machine learning. So big data is data characterized by, um, by the four V's. Google tends to define it way, that way. Some people add the fifth V, value. But um, it's characterized by, by these terms that I briefly mentioned this morning. Uh, very large observation counts. I noted that's the kind of big and big data. What I think is, is much more significant for this bootcamp is its velocity. It's high temporal resolution, um, longitudinal data, data over time. Um, and that's really important when we think about the dynamic modeling lens. We think about trying to understand behavior over time. The fact that big data is so, you know, also so tied up with this idea of providing um, understanding of processes unfolding over time is very important for informing models, for deducing models, for challenging models. Um, but big data is more than that. It's also high ver of high variety. And this too is important because often our models are integrative. They, they include many components. At the least, you know, model COVID-19 might have deaths and, and new cases and recoveries and hospitalizations, you know, and ICU admissions and ICU census. And, you know, you, you would have perhaps similar variety from, from big data that could be compared with what we see in models. And then we have high, high veracity. And, and it's not so much that any one measure and is necessarily more accurate, although it can be, you know, automatically measured weights may be more accurate than people's self-reports of weights or, if we automatically measure um, physical activity expenditure, we know since the NHANES 3 study in the US, that's much more accurate than people self-reported physical activity. But often veracity comes from being able to triangulate through multiple lines of measurement, knowing through, uh, through detection of GPS signal and, and um, potentially temperature and uh, availability of Wi-Fi and, and, um, and, and people's steps and mobility patterns, um, whether they're inside or outside right now, for example, comparing it to weather, we might be able to better know, you know are they inside or outside compared to, um, to what we would get if we asked them to report it, which would be so burdensome they, they wouldn't even report it. So often we can have greater collective accuracy through multiple measurements. Um, compared to self-reporting. And the central way in which we learn from big data is through machine learning um, models. Um, big data is um, you know, massive in its implications. You may have seen you know, images like this of what goes on in one minute on the internet. No doubt this is um, you know, a couple of years old now and these numbers are probably smaller than, than contemporary ones. Um, you know, 2.3 million searches on, on Google, uh, um, more than 3 million items shared on, on Facebook, on YouTube, you know, 2.7 million video views um, and 300 hours uh, video uploaded, for example. Um, you know, you have things on, on Snapchat, 280,000 um, snaps that are, that are shared or you know, restaurant reviews on Yelp, for example. And um, you know, similar, similar characterizations have been sent with other, other particular, um, particular networks. 
why are these significant? I mean, why isn't this just, you know, a shock and awe thing, which has little or no, full of sound and fury, but has little or no significance to health. It has every significance to health. Um, and I hope to, to explain why, why that is. Um, um, patterns like this, um, you know, services like this, I argued earlier, uh, play two really big roles. Um, one is um, they give us clues as to health, health behaviors. You know, what people are posting on, on YouTube may show aspects of knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs with respect to vaccination. Um, what they are posting in Facebook updates may clue us in to how they're feeling today. Um, um, you know, something that they send on Instagram, for example, may clue us in to what, what they're eating over time or what they're searching for in Google may express concerns. Restaurant reviews they're posting on Yelp, as we know from, from some really of some great published work, has shown great promise for revealing if people are getting sick via foodborne illness. But social media is more than that. Social media is a, is a key element of today's ecosystem that shapes knowledge, attitudes, beliefs. Whether it's spread of conspiracy theories or misinformation, disinformation, or solid information about you know, the effects of vaccinations, um, uh, whether it's stigmatization related to monkeypox or factors related to, um, to, to health issues uh, that, that arise through long COVID. Um, you know, these, these data sources shape people's behavior. And if we look at, at um, social media and we look at uh, these sort of electronic data sources, they form a potent component of this ecosystem as a driver as well as as a reflection. And there's many other sources of, of, of data that provide a mirror, a sort of more perfect mirror of our behavior, as it were. Um, point of sale records, maybe from pharmacies, uh, electronic health records, for example, uh, administrative data, but cell phone mobility data as well, um, you know, data related to um, browsing for, for health information, you know, even something as prosaic as web law, logs on a web server for people accessing information on vaccine availability um, can provide insights into, um, uh, you know, needs or preferences. Um, uh, the searches might provide clues as to, you know, when might be a, a convenient time of day to keep a clinic open. Um, so I, I argued, you know, e-context, you know, all this sort of data is not merely full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing health-wise. It signifies everything, actually. Uh, electronic context is key to understanding um, uh, what's going on out there in the world, but also to understand influence influences on the drivers of that. Um, I talked about vaccine hesitancy, um, health, health knowledge, you know, copycat suicide effects, something we've worked on in some of our modeling work and, and, and linked in with, uh, with studies uh, from that ecosystem, looking at actual tweets, um, self-harm communities, risk perception, um, uh, you know, is often um, uh, something that is affected by people's engagement with social media. Um, um, mobility is indicated with people's postings on, on you know, Foursquare or, or on um, Endomondo or other services. Risk and protective behaviors uh, uh, often, often indicated. Tragically, bullying and aggression, har harassment occur in these contexts. You know, substance use and procurement, the dark web you may have heard of, you know, for, for procurement uh, with services like Silk Road that was made famous, et cetera. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, public health messaging often takes place in this context and counter messaging from um, often from adverse actors or corporate actors promoting you know, underage um, uh, use of, of cigarettes or use of um, things like electronic cigarettes. And you can get insights into community healing and these services can play a role in community healing um, uh, through these areas as well. Um, 
uh, there's tremendous uh, insights um, and, and value that can come from reasoning specifically about this electronic universe. And often it's smartphones, which provide this, smartphones in some cases wearables, this kind of mediating influence to understand that context, to understand our navigation in it, just as they help us under, help, uh, help researchers understand navigation within a, a physical environment. And something we'll be looking at later this afternoon, um, uh, you know, if you look at search data online, um, you can found, get a lot of insight into health, health trends and uh, occurrences. Um, these were searches for whooping cough um, in Australia, uh, an area where uh, I'm fortunate to have many, many researchers and a lot of collaborative connections in teaching. And, you know, here you could see a pronounced difference in searches uh, from Australia related to pertussis or whooping cough um, prior to about March 2015 and after. There's something which occurs there in the tempo, the frequency, the volume. And it turns out it was a public, tragic public case of a baby, unvaccinated baby who passed away from pertussis. Baby Riley was exposed um, um, through, through accidentally famil, family spread of pertussis and tragically paid away. And this galvanized public awareness of the importance of, of whooping cough as a danger to, to children. And you know, if we look at um, Lyme disease and, and, and tick bites, for example, um, um, or, or rashes, uh, we could see you know, patterns over time that um, can sometimes help us, help us think through um, what, what might be underlying drivers for these? Are these causal connections? Uh, if we have time in this boot camp, we'll be talking about ways of, of trying, to, trying to identify what's a causal connection versus just a correlational one. And there's some powerful data science techniques that some, of, some here, like Wade McDonald, explored for doing exactly that. Modern, modern technologies such as smartphones allow us to understand um, things that are otherwise very burdensome to diarize or record via observation. Um, things like contact patterns, um, you know, during and, and outside of work hours. This from some of our work uh, over a decade ago uh, during uh, that came out of the H1N1 pandemic, for example, uh, here in Saskatoon. And this from some work uh, with Harvard School of Public Health on tobacco exposures and people's um, exposure to different levels of tobacco messaging in the areas around Houston, work uh, that Cheyenne RTA has, has helped uh, promote, or spaces in which contacts place around campus and evolving structures of networks um, from week one amongst a set of uh, participants to week two. Uh, we can look at things that are otherwise, again, very burdensome to record, like contact duration. Um, uh, and the relationship between things like uh, cases and, and Twitter discourse. Um, I'm going to go light on this, but I want to um, I want to uh, note importantly when it comes to data collection in this area, we have to be very cautious because we want to make sure that the data we collected is inclusive of people at wide variety of of um, of walks of life and of levels of of access. And uh, it bears noting some of the big challenges that come in when we use uh, electronic data sources like smartphones um, to, to understand um, the patterns in, in uh, very low SES groups, low socioeconomic status groups, such as those with uh, uh, individuals uh, with HIV AIDS who are who are um, also homeless. And you know, we've done quite a bit of work with, um, uh, with lower income communities and found some real barriers when it comes to work with some of the most impoverished um, groups, such as homeless individuals that really need to be overcome. Even giving out phones you know, has, its, has its limits. So you know, within this sphere, 
um, broadly uh, of these, these types of, of data, um, we can make a distinction between um, technologies that require uh, low versus high technological investment and low versus high, have low versus high privacy concerns. Self-publishing platforms um, uh, are often in, more in this sphere, things like Twitter, Reddit, YouTube. Um, uh, these, are, uh, these are platforms which are designed to publish. And as such, the privacy expectations are low with respect to, to self-publishing. They're, they're sharing it with the public and harvesting it from the public um, uh, to, to sort of identify the patterns is within the expectations of, of that self-publishing. By contrast, um, you know, uh, that stands completely different from something like Facebook um, or, or Nextdoor or, or Snapchat or, or Instagram, et cetera, where there's an expectation of a stronger privacy. But we also need to distinguish things with high technological investment and low. Um, uh, and you know, within the sphere, social media platforms, which are green here, are self-publishing platforms that can offer a great deal of, of insight while still being readily, um, readily mined and, and readily tapped for understanding uh, the data in them. So these are aspects of big data. Um, we're, we're dealing here with data that is has characterized by those four Vs, volume, velocity, veracity, and variety, um, where uh, it often requires different types of infrastructures to support it. But what's, what's most important is that it provides a level of granularity and, and resolution and, and richness um, that can allow us um, some can support very, very important insights. Um, uh, people like me or computer scientists, you know, uh, spend a lot of time working on systems that, that can process this data at scale. And indeed there's a whole, you know, subfield of data science focused on infrastructures that's designed to do exactly that. Um, uh, data science is a broad term that, that includes mechanisms, um, methodologies, infrastructures, as well as processes, principles, and practices for manipulating drawing insight from data and particularly big data being um, a large emphasis for, and reflective of the growing availability of that big data. And it really seeks effective and efficient use of the data to, to understand the world. And that includes underlying processes in the world, which, you know, until rather more recently were, were kind of in, in the background. Um, uh, the AI technique of machine learning is, is a key, key need here. Now, these supporting components, I'm not gonna really talk about, but um, uh, tools like Apache Spark or Hadoop, uh, for example, um, TensorFlow and, and its uh, engineering, um, are really uh, include key enablers for effective data science. Um, uh, these are things which uh, my fellow computer scientists um, uh, have done great work in advancing, um, and they involve very sophisticated technologies to handle this sort of big data that comes from all these data sources we've talked about. You know, social media and smartphones, and electronic health records. And, and things we haven't touched on, but, uh, but which I think fit in here as well, administrative data and wastewater, et cetera, um, and, and really render them into high level insights. Um, and this includes many components that we won't talk about much in this bootcamp, um, distributed and scalable software architectures, computational capacities that can can leverage parallel computation to, to analyze this data, efficient storage and retrieval. These are all, these are all really important um, for realizing this vision. And fortunately, there's many smart people working to make, uh, to advance these tools, uh, to make, make possible the sorts of analyses we're talking about. And in my group, 
I'm fortunate to have people like uh, Eric or like Lu Jie Duan, who has, who has uh, since um, moved on to Google or, uh, or Win Chil Chen, who have um, advanced our ability to perform these analyses at scale. Um, let's talk about machine learning though here. Um, machine learning is part of data science. It's its key method traditionally for turning these sort of rich data sources, particularly big data into insight. Um, it's, it's absolutely central and the most prominent analysis tool for data science. Um, so what is machine learning? Well, broadly, it's methods that allow algorithms to automatically learn from. It's important, that's the learning, right? And, it, and improve performance based on new data and experiences um, and or experiences. Um, it's used heavily by other areas of artificial intelligence. You remember this idea here, even something like robotics um, or natural language processing can make use of machine learning. Um, and it, it, it has a particularly centrality of focus, which, which has great equity implications in, in public health, um, both directly and, and indirectly. Let's, let's dive into more of the machine learning side because it is central to this bootcamp. Most of the methods that we're talking about can be described as machine learning methods um, that we're combining with, with dynamic modeling methods. Um, in some cases, we'll give reference to machine learning methods that deduce structure for, for dynamic model. Let's, let's talk about um, uh, machine learning. So machine learning has evolved over the decades. I took my first machine learning class in 1992, I believe it was, uh, spring of 92, I think. And back then it was, um, pattern analysis and machine intelligence or, or um, pattern recognition, et cetera. Um, and that thread is, has kept constant in it, but it's, it's come in, in many different flavors, many different waves, um, which, which still coexist. Um, and you know, if, if you wanna learn machine learning, you, you need to be advised to be aware that there's many types of machine learning out there. And you're, you know, this person's machine learning may look in its particulars rather different from this other's. There's probabilistic machine learning methods, um, and and some of the references I suggest, such as the book uh, the book by Murphy, um, uh, fall very much within this camp. There's kernel based methods such as support vector machine and others that were really popular in the 1990s, for example. Um, there's statistical learning theory. Um, uh, such as by uh, Tib Sharani and, and Hasty and, and as codified in their book. There's connectionist methods, which went through three levels of, of, of kind of um, heydays um, in the late 60s with perceptrons, in the late 80s and early 90s with neural networks, and then um, most recently with deep learning methods and deep multi-layer deep multi-layer networks. Um, once, once we had really found how to train them effectively, et cetera. Reinforcement learning is kind of a trial and error based method associated with Q learning, et cetera. So there's different machine learning approaches, communities, uh, methods that the general term machine learning um, involves. Um, and one thing that people in the health sciences find challenging within this area is the fact that machine learning has its own jargon, its own um, sort of set of, of descriptors that, that have evolved over the years for referring to quantities that have direct analogs over an epidemiology or very close analogs in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, and, and what's challenging to a lot of students when they wanna learn about machine learning who are from say a biostats background or epidemiology background or general statistics background is that there's all this, uh, this different use of terms which turn out to be rather similar. Um, and uh, so for example, um, the, term, uh, the term feature 
or attribute or field or predictor is called an independent variable in epidemiology biostats. Uh, um, and output or response variable machine learning, sort of the, the, the results of, of the model, the outcome of it might be called the dependent or outcome variable over an epidemiology. Um, a ground truth label, a kind of label that's used in what's called supervised machine learning, something we'll come to shortly to kind of label something is might be called a known or observed outcome or value of a dependent variable. Um, and confusingly, the term regression in machine learning is often used just for an estimate, what would be termed an estimator in epidemiology or biostats with a continuous outcome. Um, and classification, by contrast, would, would refer to something might be indeed uh, also referred to it, uh, with a, a classifier term over an epidemiology. Um, uh, and the term bias, which of course has such significance in epidemiology in a, in a, in a sense of, of equity concerns, refers in an engineering sense to an intercept, um, a beta zero term as it might be seen in a, in a biostatistics model where you might have beta zero plus beta one times X one, et cetera. Um, so there's all these kind of um, different terms which have somewhat uh, similar uses and sometimes the same term which is used in a different way here. And if anyone's interested in this, um, I'd suggest this article in the American Journal of, of, uh, of Epidemiology as a, as a good place to, uh, to take a look. Um, now, a key constraint here um, uh, in machine learning has to do with the availability of known outcomes for data points. And so if, if we're trying to have an effective classifier or we're trying to to do a prediction, not necessarily over time, but the value of a, of a variable whose value we don't know. Like, like whether someone right now might have diabetes or might have a major depressive disorder based on a tweet. Um, uh, you know, there's a key question that shapes our methods, um, that shapes what type of method we might consider, what sphere of method. And, and the question is for, for how big a subset of data do we know the correct answer? Um, for example, if we want to classify whether tweets exhibit, you know, suicidal ideation by a tweet uh, by the tweeter, um, it's a, it's a different situation if we have a bunch of tweets where, you know, those with uh, psychiatric training, years of psychiatric training, have classified that, um, uh, or where we know through other aspects of uh, electronic health record data that this is a person with suicidal ideation or, or it isn't. Or if we just have a bunch of tweets and we, we don't know the correct answer for, for a bunch of them. Um, or, you know, if we have, um, um, if we have uh, COVID-19 case data and we wanna know, is this person likely to pass away from COVID-19? Uh, based on their early data. Um, if we know, if we have a set of data where we know they did and a set of data where we know they didn't, that puts us in a different situation where if we don't know the outcome and we want to come up with something that, you know, will recognize salient patterns that might allow us to predict big differences between, you know, some individuals and others that might relate to, to survival. Um, uh, so, so whether we have, um, uh, whether we have, uh, excuse me, I just want to make sure the chat window disappeared here. And so I wanted to make sure that that was up in case uh, to monitor chat here. Um, uh, so within this, this sphere, um, uh, depending on whether we have a lot or a little, of this labeled data, of this data where we know the true situation, this ground truth data. You know, this restaurant was implicated in a foodborne illness outbreak and this wasn't, versus a situation where we just have this data on restaurants and we want to know, gosh, are they, you know, group restaurants into, into categories that might reflect high risk and low risk ones with the presumption being that the high risk ones might 
might, uh, would be at high risk of foodborne illness outbreak, but we don't know whether or not they did have it. Um, if, if we have no labeled data, we're dealing with unsupervised learning. We're, we're trying to discover patterns and structure, we're trying to discover regularities um, that, are, that are hidden there, might not be obvious, um, but um, we don't have any uh, ability to say for sure how much does it match the true situation. Um, uh, and this is a big area of machine learning, rec recognizing structure, recognizing patterns. By contrast, if we have a large set of labeled ones or a pretty large set, we can, we can do unsupervised learning. We could find this latent structure. We could do clustering, for example, and find clusters, but we can do more than that. We can engage in supervised learning. We can try to, to get our machine learning model to to, to, to come up with its own way, its own recipe for predicting very accurately with high sensitivity and specificity. This is a case of a foodborne illness, a restaurant that will likely have a foodborne illness outbreak, or this is a person based on the tweet that has major depressive disorder, whereas this is not. And if we have a small number, both supervised and semi-supervised learning might be uh, possible, where semi-supervised learning is only viable in certain causal or statistical context. Um, uh, so it's, it's a technique that can be, uh, can be viable if you have a, a smaller number. Um, uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk about, uh, yes, a uh, question. Um, can we include a level of certainty in machine learning? Um, uh, yes, so, so commonly in machine learning, uh, it's not universal, but there are many cases where we'll associate a degree of confidence about a prediction as part of a machine learning um, result. So we'll, we'll say with very high confidence, um, you know, this restaurant is likely to be undergoing a foodborne illness outbreak, could be responsible for it based on, you know, recent gastro highly credible gastrointestinal illness reports and people's smartphone data about where they've, restaurants they visited in the past 30 days or something like that. We, we might say this restaurant's at very high risk of being the, the spreader. This other one is plausible, but it's, it's at lower risk of, of, of spreading foodborne illness right now. So yes, it's, it's quite common. We'll have a, a measure of kind of confidence or cert, certitude or, um, or degree of, of sureness associated with that. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, okay, so I'd like to talk about three broad classes of machine learning. Um, and um, I talked about supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised. Um, description, the, the descriptive classes of machine learning um, are commonly undertaken in an unsupervised fashion. We're find, trying to find these hidden patterns, um, these hidden regularities that might clue us into real differences there. Um, but we don't need to be told what the true situation is. Um, just noticing big differences between, between individuals. Maybe they're patterns of long COVID, for example, which might then start to get us thinking and theory building about, gosh, these are, maybe these are people that have different, they're different endotypes, different phenotypes associated with long COVID progression. Um, Another case though, we want to do prediction. And again, the term prediction here is confusing because in a, in a dynamic modeling or system science approach, we think prediction like predict over time. It's not always that. It, it can be just predicting a, a variable we don't know. Like does this person right now have major depressive disorder or do they have suicidal ideation or do they have COVID-19 or what have you. And then there's causal prediction and in a way I'm gonna come back to, but which starts to get closer in spirit to a lot of, um, uh, a lot of dynamic modeling needs. Okay, let's talk about description. Um, so description is about finding hidden structure, um, finding underlying structure that makes orderly something that otherwise might seem just a jumble of data, a cacophony of data. So we have a whole bunch of data 
and maybe there's hidden patterns in it. If we just know the right lens to use on it, you know, we see certain big patterns that explain so much about the other data. Um, um, often this is exploratory uh, type of work and it's typically unsupervised. Um, uh, and, you know, commonly involves descriptive stats um, describing, you know, via scatter plots and histograms and box plots and, and, and you know, uh, measures a, a sample, sample means and medians, et cetera, uh, some broad components, but, but often involves a lot more than that, uh, clustering, data visualization, um, and, and more deeply, um, latent variable identification, identifying the latent classes or, or, or latent structures, um, maybe they're continuous, underlying this data. And, and there's this whole sphere of generative approaches, which if it gets you to start thinking about dynamic modeling, it's with good reason, because dynamic modeling is all about generative approaches. Um, um, you'll find a book on generative social science by Josh Epstein, which is all about system science, dynamic modeling, particularly agent-based modeling use. Um, and he argues, you know, you don't understand a phenomenon until you can generate it without presupposing, it, generate it from other, from other phenomena. Um, and in this, in this context for, for descriptive machine learning, um, the descriptive context, um, the description use of, of machine learning, um, there's a set of rich methods that have come out um, uh, of two types. Some that are theory-based, and typically these are Bayesian in character, things like hidden Markov models and particle filter and particle MCMC, which we'll hear a lot about. There were, we're positing something about the underlying system and we're deducing something about this structure we're, we're positing um, about the particulars of it. We're grounding our assumptions about it. We're, we're, we're deducing the distribution of the system across these. But then there's these connectionist approaches based typically on deep learning, such as autoencoders and variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks, which deduce structure, the underlying structure of the system without pre-existing theory being imposed as to the structure of that, the, the particulars of that structure. It deduces things in a universe of structure. Now, I, I need to emphasize in the Bayesian side, typically, um, you know, commonly these might be taken um, like with our particle filtering techniques to involve cause, positive causal structure. So that then we could turn around and examine and examine counterfactuals. And we based on maybe, you know, um, uh, clinical studies and, and, and other observations uh, of say natural history of infection, et cetera, which are well, which are well studied and, and have theory behind them. Um, uh, by contrast, in, in connectionist approaches, by default, these are not under, undertaken in a, in a causal sense. We're finding structure that might not have causal significance, but it could still be really important for distinguishing A from B. It could still be really important for recognizing the different phenotypes of long COVID, for example, um, or different phenotypes of, of depression. Um, Another type of need is dimensionality reduction. So here we're, we're taking this, maybe we have you know, 100 different variables and we find through analysis um, and PCA and ICA or um, independent components analysis are, are two prominent approaches. There's some really exciting work I, I learned about recently in topographic, uh, topological data analysis that, um, has a lot of promise here as well um, and, and has much less strict assumptions about linearity. But basically they find a way of, of recognizing these patterns that extend across the data set and boiling it down to a much smaller number of salient areas of variation, co-variation. They, they capture those patterns, reduce it to kind of the natural set of um, degrees of variation um, by which it varies. Um, and often these patterns across many, many variables might be explained by just, you know, three or four salient um, patterns of variation and it explains the rest. Um, TSNE is, is uh, 
T, uh, T stochastic neighbor embedding, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedded, and, and um, there's a set of other uh, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques that can be very useful in reducing a heck of a cacophony of changes um, into a, a smaller number of, of, uh, of differences. Um, uh, some work that Wade has done and others in our group have done with causality detection with CCM falls in here. Um, here through a delay embedding, you can take data that looks almost random. It looks all the world just like random, you know, variation, willy-nilly, you know, um, data going up and down and no obvious rhyme or reason to it. And if you look through the right lens, ba-boom, you see sudden structure that can be um, characterized in a very simple way um, by hidden structure. And, uh, and that can allow you to do prediction of this data. It can also just allow you to understand uh, uh, the, the features of this data in a much crisper way than if you're just looking at the time series. It all boils down to a simple structure. So, you know, there's great orderliness if you know the right way to look at it. Um, and, um, and density estimation can fall into here um, uh, as, as well. Um, uh, okay, so phase space plots is what I was talking to you about using there. Um, we do quite a bit of uh, application of this in, um, uh, in, in our work uh, with, with time series data. And what you can often find is characterization using simple plots like this, uh, what's called a, an embedded phase plot, um, uh, looking at um, two, two variables here. This is actually not embedded, excuse me. This is plotting two variables against each other in terms of a trajectory. So at any one time, it's one of these dots, you have a certain number of daily reported cases, a certain number of daily reported deaths, and it evolves. And if you look at this, there's often, you know, enormous regularity to just how it evolves and different waves will look kind of similar in terms of being um, sort of similar patterns of, of loops within a system like this. And we see this quite a bit and it can be used to kind of anticipate where things are going in a model free way. This does not presuppose any particular model. It let's just sort of take this data with the right lens we can recognize this, this hidden structure. Um, uh, this is England's hospitalizations from the pandemic, I think uh, about a year ago, um, looking at different waves, uh, successive waves of the pandemic. Uh, excuse me, this was probably in December, this past December. Um, uh, and I won't go into this, but this is another way to capture those regularities. Or here for Omicron, um, for Omicron looking at you know, the progression of, of different particular jurisdictions. And you can see here patterns of evolution that again are model free, but capture some, some broad regularities. Um, what's powerful here is th this sort of plot doesn't presuppose any model, but it captures likely trajectories uh, and bounds them as they will evolve. This is new cases in the past week, and this is change in the rate compared to the preceding week. And what you can see is it kind of follows a set, sort of natural order of things. So sometimes when we look at data, um, there's structure there we don't see initially. And methods like this can allow you to quickly scan for the structure and recognize these patterns that just might not stick out originally. And that can allow you confidence about where things might be going. Just like plotting you know, a, uh, a hurricane on a map um, might allow you to anticipate where it might land by projecting it forward. Approaches like this can do something similar. Now, what's not obvious here, but which is of great significance is it turns out that these techniques are, whether consciously or unconsciously, tapping into the state space of the system. It turns out this can be viewed also as a system science technique because when you plot things out in this way, um, it, it turns out that you are 
reproducing in aspects of the systems evolution in state space. If we have time for it later in the boot camp, I will explain that. But the reason we see these sort of regularities is because there's regularities in state space. Um, this from some Saskatchewan data where you can see successive waves of the pandemic. This is with some noise added to it. Um, and here we get you know, tweets referencing opioids, for example, on, on Twitter. And what we're doing is we're sort of classifying broad sets of tweets into these patterns that if you look at any tweet, it's, it's not obvious, but what these machine learning algorithms can do is sort of find this hidden structure and recognize, look, there's basically five major types of tweets here um, and five major communities of tweeting, which can be useful if you want to, um, uh, to, to be able to understand how to best, um, uh, for example, message to those communities, engage in risk communication, um, better understand uh, what unmet health needs are associated with them, et cetera. Um, okay, um, and yes, I noted CCM with, and CCM provides convergent cross-mapping provides this way of distinguishing causal linkages versus non-causal linkages. So if we think back to those graphs of, uh, uh, of for example, uh, Lyme disease um, versus rashes, um, to what degree is that a causal connection or is, is that just happenstance of statistical correlation? CCM, provides this method rooted in system science, but it's a data science method for distinguishing these two. Um, that is all about description. It's about finding hidden order. It's about finding hidden patterns. And, and that might allow you to distinguish people, you know, in one group from another um, of lower risk, for example. Um, it might allow you to to better develop theory, which can help you understand why the needs are so different for these different sub-communities. It might allow you to recognize these individuals are thriving and these are not. But there's another major use of, 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 um, of machine learning that I wanna emphasize. And it's arguably, it's, it's arguably even more important. It's certainly uh, pursued at least as often as description as important as description is. In this other approach, our techniques under the rubric of prediction. So description is about finding hidden order. Prediction is it's about identifying systematic ways to anticipate outcomes. And when I say this, I don't mean outcomes over time always, it can be. But often these are outcomes that are instead um, about filling in missing information, information we'd like to know, but we can't like, like predicting, does this person have this major depressive disorder? Um, so in contrast to last ones, which are presumed, which didn't require any ground truth data and they're, they're, they're um, pursued in an unsupervised way. We don't need to know the true situation. We're discovering these clusters that are that are intriguing, and now we've got to investigate more. Why are they? But we don't need to have them labeled ahead of time. But prediction um, typically is pursued in a supervised or at least semi-supervised where we where we have some some data that's um, um, that's labeled, but large amounts that that aren't. Um, and so the basic problem is we want to generalize some examples. We want to take some examples, have it think about those examples. Importantly, remember this is machine learning, learn from those examples. And then we want to create it to create a, a general rule that will, that will allow it to, to predict in general. Um, uh, the situation for a given example. So if we have some examples, uh, we call them, their features are, are X and, and, and we wanna have an outcome Y, the, the, the label is Y. We wanna, that's the outcome 
for them. So maybe these are tweets and we want to know, are they major examples of major depressive disorders, for example, or maybe these X's are, are cases of COVID, you know, uh, um, characteristics of COVID-19 patients and why is whether or not it's a fatal case of COVID-19. Why is sort of the outcome we're interested in predicting in general? And we're lucky enough to have this for a subset of the data, these, these examples. And we wanna tell in the prediction, we wanna say, go figure, go co come up with a general way of recognizing the Y for a given X. Um, return a trained function that for any XI, for any, anyone, not, not in the example shown to it, it can predict the outcome. Um, it, can, it can predict what the situation would be, whether this person is likely to pass away from COVID-19, whether this person um, uh, probably has a major depressive disorder, um, whether this person um, might be struggling with suicidal ideation, whether this person um, is at high risk of opioid overdose death um, or of, of, of overdosing. Um, so, this prediction includes two broad classes, which, which have different names in machine learning. Um, if Y is continuous, if, if Y is some outcome that, you know, might be we're predicting what their, um, their viral load will be for an HIV um, patient, for example, it's continuous, or maybe uh, it's what, um, you know, what, uh, what level of, of severity they will have in terms of long COVID, in terms of uh, um, the severity of, of brain fog or the duration or what have you. It's a continuous outcome. We call it regression. Um, and if it's, if it's categorical, whether or not they have a major depressive disorder, yes or no, it's, uh, it's called classification. Um, and uh, it can be further subdivided into dichotomous classification or nominal, or in some cases, ordinal, where it's more or less, you know, the degree of functional limitation this person will have from long COVID or what have you. Um, uh, and uh, when we're trying to do this, um, we, we need to typically define a way of judging how good is our trained function. So we come up with different possible rules for classifying a given X. Even rules for classifying whether someone will have a major depressive disorder based on the tweet or based on electronic health records, whether they're likely to end up, um, um, you know, representing with an opioid overdose uh, in the ER or what have you. For different rules, we want a way of, of judging how good is that rule? Um, how, how effective is it? And generally, we'll have some way of sort of making it not overfit to the data. And one of the main ways is, is, is by something called cross-validation, but we often will have what's called a regularization. Um, uh, so, so here we're trying to distinguish, say, um, non-smoking individuals, this is from Narges, uh, for example, um, RTA, um, who are smoking versus non-smoking. Um, uh, and this from Cheyenne here, an RC curve for determining for predicting measles outbreaks. Um, uh, this is a receiver operating characteristic curve. It kind of says um, for false positive rate, what's your true positive rate? And you kind of want it to have, for, very, for no false positives have perfect true positivity, um, uh, true positivity rate. That's what you'd ideally like to have an AUC of one, and you can do very, very well. Um, or here we predicted whether someone's sitting, standing, walking, or off person based on their smartphone data at any given time. Um, now, it's important for this audience to understand, particularly those coming from a health science background, some distinctions here. And, and, and for those sort of statistics background, this may be disorienting. Um, um, people, I, I've sometimes seen people um, react oddly and, and querulously to comments you know, about, about machine learning techniques. Because if you look up in a book on machine learning techniques, such as Murphy's book, which I recommended on probabilistic machine learning, 
you'll see in it techniques that are part of the central canon of, of um, practicing statistics, things like logistic regression, um, for example. Um, and uh, I've seen people say, well, wait, that's not a machine learning technique. That's a statistics technique. Um, and the truth is there's, there is some overlap, a sizable overlap between computational statistics and machine learning. And that'll be one way to approach that issue. But, but the deeper truth is that it's not just a matter of labels. Machine learning um, uh, will often use the same formalisms like a logistic regression um, as well, but it will, it will do so in a different way and often with different goals. This reminds you of our morning discussion of you know, system dynamics, uh, compartmental modeling, or ABM, or, or discrete event simulation, having not just different formalisms, but different goals. It's with, it's with good reason. Often what distinguishes techniques more fundamentally than the formalism they use is the goal. And machine learning's goals traditionally have, have one overarching goal, and that's prediction. How well can we get this function to predict for a given, a given value here, predict what the true outcome is. That's what it is trying to maximize. It is trying to be, to really generalize this and just nail it in terms of knowing what, what the correct answer is. Um, statistics, by contrast, is often focused on understanding, you know, the associations in greater depths. So often we're trying to estimate the coefficients and, and, and have a, a level of of reliability of those, those coefficients. Um, we're interested in effect sizes associated with them. Um, and you know, we're interested in knowing is this a statistically significant relationship between that 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 we are identifying. Um, is this coefficient statistically significantly different um, from, from the null hypothesis? Um, machine learning is focused on on prediction. And frankly, it generally doesn't care about p-values. Um, uh, it's, it's trying to predict the missing value. Um, things like multicollinearity for statistics are, are, are real concerns. Because if, if two things co-vary directly, you know, education and income, for example, um, uh, if they co-vary so directly, we, and we try to look at the association between the outcome variable and each of these two things, we can't tell you know which of them it is that's um, that's directly associated with that because one predicts the other. In machine learning, frankly, multicollinearity they don't care. They just want to predict this missing value. Um, if the different values of x always co-vary, well, fine, we can still predict the the missing value. Um, so machine learning's goal is often rather different. Um, Often statistics is, is interested in how to explain variation in the outcome variable um, through variation in, in, in the income and, and, and parcel out that association, whereas machine learning is, is interested in prediction. Um, and, and this is a difference which can lead to some misunderstandings or some, you know, um, some passing uh, without communication between them. Um, uh, now, there are differences beyond this. The model for machine learning is fit via training, um, whereas uh, often, you know, in statistics, you fit it via estimation based on all the data. Um, that's not often possible because the volume of data in machine learning. Um, uh, and, you know, the, generally speaking, um, selection, uh, one is selecting features um, here where sometimes the variables are are given in statistics. We don't have the luxury of, of selecting which features we're going to include or not, which, which variables we include or not. Um, often we're exploring machine learning diverse models, whereas we might have one model we're, we're investigating in statistics based on, on, on theory. We, we use generalizability via cross-validation here, whereas in statistics, we're pursuing it based on um, uh, a smaller number of, of carefully selected uh, 
parameters. We're, we're keeping down the complexity of, of the model, for example. Um, and you know, here we throw all the computational resources we have to find the best, the best model here. But um, you know, in statistics, we make use of computationally frugal techniques. Um, so these are two very different approaches that often will use the same formalism, like, like a logistic regression, um, but they'll do it differently. Um, and so here with gradient descent, you're trying to maximize, you know, minimize the error, get better and better fitting um, with different subsets of data, for example. Now, a key component here is what's called cross-validation. So here we're, we're, we're trying to get generality of this model. We don't want it to overfit. And so what we do is we train it with one subset of data, maybe most of the data, these ones here, and we test it on the other set. We, we, we train it on a set that's, that's used to, to kind of um, estimate the values of, of the, um, for the model to get it to perform as well as possible or to identify a good model. Um, and then we will test how well it performs on data that wasn't used to train it. And then we'll rotate. We'll take a different subset of the data put it aside, train it on the rest, and then test it on that one that we put aside. And we'll rotate through. This is called rotation estimation. And the idea is that we want a model that does really well for all of these. It's not hard coding in these relationships on the things used for training. Um, rather, it, it has a requisite generalizability that will allow it to perform well. Um, even if we are testing it against, we do out of sample prediction. We test it on things that it wasn't, that it wasn't, it didn't know about when it was being trained. This is called cross validation. It's cross because we train it on one set and we test it on the other set. We go across and we test it on the other set. Uh, and we evaluate it many, many times. Rotate, 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 rotate. And if this sounds computationally you know, intensive, um, it is. Now, we're talking here about, yes, a uh, question. I uh, see a raised hand. Um, yes, cross-validation. Uh-huh. Is there a question about cross-validation? Uh, did, did I, did I, oh, um, yeah. Um, this is a, a good question. I'm not sure that I'm set up to, to uh, answer that here. I think uh, amongst other things, um, uh, there's, there's I, I, in some way, you know, I, in some ways I view leave one out cross, you know, validation um, as being kind of an example of cross validation with um, um, it's, it's sort of one specific type of, of cross validation. Um, just like you could think of, uh, you know, jackknife as kind of related to, to bootstrapping in, in, a, in a particular case. But um, uh, I, I think it's both are united by the desire to, um, to try out of sample prediction, um, uh, test it on things that it wasn't trained for. With cross validation, Often we do this uh, with what's called k-fold cross-validation. In this case, it's five, right? We, we, we are rotating among five. Sometimes we do 10, sometimes we do four, um, rather than leaving, um, leaving one out. So we may leave out a, 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 general, um, uh, you know, a general subset. Well, I, I think uh, in terms of general recommendation, um, I would view leave one out, um, as, as, you know, a subset of cross-validation. And I would suggest thinking, you know, beyond that, but it certainly shares in spirit the desire to ensure generalizability by, um, by this whole idea of, of ensuring out-of-sample prediction abilities. Um, uh, so I would say, you know, making use of the more general technique, um, or being open to make use of the general technique is a recommendation here um, and not strictly, you know, adhering to leaf one out um, uh, methods, but, um, 
um, I'd, I'd want to um, see because leave one out may may leave open the, the notion of what one is, one block rather than one particular sample. And, and I want to see how that's used in that, in that community. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave those comments there, but um, uh, you know, I view one as kind of a subset of the other and would suggest using a, a more general, uh, general of the two. Um, K-fold is the number of, um, number, no, it's, uh, it's a good question. It typically goes with both. So if you have, five folds cross validation, you have five data sets and you will rotate, this is this rotation estimation in a round robin way. And typically you would then have this, um, this five different uh, evaluations where you systematically rotated it through all of those different data sets, um, all those different kind of possibilities. Now, I will say that this is a particularly simple example. And what's more challenging is if there's structure in the data that prevents this. Narges has worked with cases like this. And in general, when we have temporal data, we, we maybe, which depends on continuity, we maybe can't take out, you know, just any arbitrary subset of it because we're depending on it to be contiguous, to be continuous. Um, and there are opportunities for for ability to rotate through all of them are, are limited. So we may just be able to do predictive validation. Like we use all the data till a given point and then we predict forward. Uh, data to a given point, predict forward. And I know Jalen um, and Viam and Xiao Yan have been involved a great deal uh, in that. And I think some others as well. So K-fold, you know, most commonly they go together. Uh, but there are cases where we might have different data sets and, um, uh, and, and we might not be able to examine all, all possible, evaluate all of them because of, there's some temporal structure or dependency structure between them. And, and so I'd say in general, it refers to the data sets, the number of data sets, whereas these evaluations are are evaluating it for each legal um, sort of combination of these data sets. Hopefully that's helpful, Genevieve. So I wanna talk about these methods. So because um, these methods have you know, caught the public interest and, and uh, I'm not even going into you know, some of the really exciting things here, you know, the use of deep learning to perform these matches um, in, in, in description to be able to, to capture these hidden structures behind faces or behind you know, images of cats or what have you to recognize these salient underlying regularities that, that there's no really theory to, to inform. Uh, but I wanna talk about a challenge here. And I wanna talk about something that harks back to our discussion this morning. Um, you may remember this gentleman from that. Um, and I talked about the limits of using associational models. And I, 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 I noted that, you know, if we're seeking to drive forward off-road, we're gonna enjoy limited utility through looking at our real view mirror. If we're going around in the same data generating process around a racetrack, what's at our back view mirror may be pretty indicative of what's coming up. If the data generating process stays the same, we'll do well to, um, um, you know, if by looking out of the back, we, we might be able to rely on these patterns we've noted, these, these regularities that we've noted, these hidden structures. We may expect them to be the same. Um, but what if something totally changes? What if a new vaccine is introduced? What if in these, this graph of Omicron progressions and, and, and cases and, and, um, and, and case rates here, we, um, we are to see a new variant coming in. Um, or, or what if there's a new therapy available, you know, Paxlovid, for example, um, um, would suddenly, um, since Paxlovid uh, helps head off the need for hospitalization, would we suddenly see a discontinuity in these, in these trends, right? This is a very real concern. Maybe there's structure here right now, 
with this data generating process. But if, what if we shift the ground out from under us? What if we change the data generating process? What then, right? Um, um, Maybe now we're going off road and what's out that rear view mirror is not going to, to be highly predictive of what's coming up. Um, this is constantly in our mind as system scientists. We're trying to build these models that will allow us to ask these what if counterfactual situations. We saw it this morning, right? What if we increase the number of doctors? How would that affect wait times? What if we went and, and you know, lowered the, um, or increased the recovery rate. We found people quicker who are, who are, who are sicker through contact tra more effective contact tracing. Or what if we added grocery stores? I didn't include that in the Melbourne, or I didn't show it in the Melbourne example. We could have clicked around and added grocery stores. Um, distributed parks more broadly, how would that change things? That's so constantly in our mind, these counterfactuals with system science. So much of the goal of the models is often to inform these what if questions. But you know, when we're, when we're working from the data up and we're recognizing these patterns, it's contingent. We're, we're recognizing associations between things that may or may not be causal. And how are we sure that you know, these patterns will remain the same, right? How are we sure that we'll still see that? Um, some of those models I've written this morning, I've, I've added in you know, changes to it and, and you see changes in the data that's generated, the patterns, those scatter plots you may remember between distance, you know, ratio of distance to a grocery store to compared to a convenience store versus weight, that can radically change if you, if you go end up um, putting in tons of parks, for example. If we wanna bend the curve, the curve is bent, you know, it, the, the, the observed patterns, the relationship between variables may be changed. As, as deep as those patterns seem, they may be, that relationship may be altered. As finely as we could predict before, maybe those predictions start to fall apart. This is, this is it's a risk. And, and you know, people have long noted that causation does not apply, or the correlation does not apply causation. Um, to give uh, an example, two examples of this, you know, if we were to look at the relationship in Germany between, uh, over time, between pairs of brooding storks in red and, and number of babies here, um, you could be excused for thinking, I mean, look at this scatter plot. I mean, my God, look at, look at that, look at that uh, uh, amazing regression. I mean, it's an R squared of 0.9, what is it, 0.99. Um, um, you know, you, you could be excused for taking that association. I mean, come on, that has to, there has to be some causation there, but you would be woefully wrong if you thought, you know, uh, babies cause storks or <clears throat> storks cause babies um, or bring babies. Um, or if you look at civil executions in the United States population and you were to look at, you know, the, the relationship between them, you could be, you um, you, you could you, you'd be on a fool's errand if you thought that you know by predicting um, by examining the number of executions you know will be determining the U.S. population. Um, so correlation does not imply uh, causation, and um, and you know reflecting this, um, AI practitioners, machine learning practitioners have been keenly aware of the limitations uh, of these methods. No matter how good the fits are, they are contingent. They are, they are fraught with risk of change. And at the same time, there's other challenges. Um, there's challenges associated with explicability associated with these, these patterns. Um, uh, the need to, to explain why we can distinguish whether there's going to be an outbreak or not in the next three weeks or whether our ICUs are likely to be filled up. If we want to explain that to a decision maker, they're going to want some confidence that's based on something sensible. There's a story there that they can understand, they can tell. Um, it's based on something more than you know happenstance and, and the splitting of turtle shells. Um, uh, we also want strong generalizability across contexts. We'd like to be able to 
to take a model that has done well in Toronto and use it in Saskatoon. Or we might be able to, might be interested in taking a model that has predicted well, you know, with, um, with Omicron and use it for BA4 and BA5. So it, it performed well BA1, and now we want to use it BA4, BA5. And we want to be able to reason about counterfactuals. We want to be able to reason about, you know, how well will this hold when we change things? For all of these reasons, we're interested in the causal structure of the system. It's, it's those things that allow us to tell stories about what's going on, to, to explain what's going on in meaningful terms. We're dealing with causal relationships. Um, to generalize across contexts, because causation is going to typically be preserved. Um, the causal structure of the system is the same in Germany and France and, and the US in, it, in its basic essentials. And we want to be able to reason about counterfactuals if certain actions are taken by us or new vaccines arrive or, or you know, new um, therapeutic treatments like Paxlovid, et cetera. Um, now, when we're dealing with this challenge, um, uh, there's a desire to weave together posited causal structure uh, of the system um, with, with these machine learning techniques. And most of these approaches require you to, to posit, to postulate some causal structure of a system and capture that in your model. Now, if that makes you think about this morning where we you know, built those networks of interactions, if it makes you think about this sort of thing or makes you think about you know, something having to do with um, the structure of, of you know, a person's progression here among different states, or to think about that trauma center and its, um, and its uh, progression you know, um, in terms of the, um, the causal pathways here, the, 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 the care pathways in this case, um, it's again with good reason. We're capturing structure in our models that, that are postulated causal structure. And um, foremost practitioner of this and codifier of this um, uh, early on was Judea Pearl um, at UCLA. Um, and um, for those not familiar with it, he has a, a famous book called Causation, where he, he, he lays this forth, causal statistical analysis. And uh, you know, he argues that you want to lay, lay down a positive causal, a causal structure, and then you can challenge that causal structure. You can cross-check it. You can, um, you can um, assess, assess whether it holds water in light of the data. Um, but you can also use it to estimate the strength of relationships causally, causally between factors. Not, not merely associationally, um, but, but causally we can find relationships between factors. And causal AI, causal machine learning, seeks to do exactly that. It seeks to have prediction methods that are causally rooted. Um, and this, again, should make you think about dynamic modeling because you know, there too we're postulating a model. We're, we're positing a certain structure. We're seeking to test it in the crucible of evidence, to challenge it, to refine it. Well, if that sounds like this, and, you know, it, 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 again, it's with good reason. Um, now, um, some of the other methods we've talked about, like CCM, can give causal hints. They can say, look, this is causally driving that, but not vice versa. Or it can detect bidirectional um, causation. And some of the work that Wade has done, um, uh, you know, clearly shows the power of these techniques in the context of practical epidemiological questions and their ability to even see through things like the ecological fallacy. Um, but, you know, in this sphere, we're working with a model um, that's a predictive AI model. It goes through cross-validation. 
it's challenged in the same way as other AI models. It's per, it's uh, it's estimated um, through through fitting, but it is a causally rooted model and therefore has better explainability and has generalizability across contexts and better ability to reason against counterfactuals. And and Bernhard Scholkoff, who's one of the uh, was one of the early leaders in creating things, uh, earlier generations of AI methods like support vector machines, um, is, a, is a notable practitioner in this here, has a wonderful lecture on learning causal mechanisms, which I'd recommend. Um, but you know, he argues that statistical models, causal models, and dynamic models um, exist in this, um, in, in this uh, common space. Um, and uh, statistical models, and I include here machine learning models, um, uh, have very strong ability to learn from data, learn patterns, recognize these salient patterns, um, um, and and, uh, and and engage in in rich analysis of an existing data generating process. But if there's an intervention our bets are thrown off. Um, if we're shifted to other contexts, we don't know which of those patterns will be conserved, will, be, will carry over. Um, and they tend not to support explanation very well. We find this, this relationship, which seems to predict super well, but we're not quite sure why. Now, I want to emphasize that's not necessarily a, a, a showstopper in many areas of application of AI. It's not like we're talking about something which renders AI um, you know, deeply flawed, far, far from it. I mean, let's think about where AI, AI is applied in some amazing ways, right? Uh, if we wanna create an algorithm as we've done in our lab for recognizing coughing in individuals, um, and we create a machine learning model for that, maybe it's a hidden Markov model, maybe it's a, um, a deep learning model. Um, uh, you know, there's there's nothing there that's that that's likely to to say that um, uh, this is going to be deeply problematic because we're going to need to shift it to a totally different context. We don't need to support explanations about why a certain sound range is the salient one for predicting coughing. Um, generally, if it performs very well, that's fine. If we want to recognize um, in images. The, the presence of um, uh, you know of uh, of uh, something dangerous, maybe it's of a gun, or we want to recognize the occurrence of an anti-vaccine message in a in an image. Um, we don't need a theory of how to recognize anti-vaccine images necessarily. We don't need a a theory of how to recognize a cat in an image. Um, uh, we we can do so in a way that that doesn't have to be theory based quite reasonably. Uh, if you want to recognize human speech using machine learning models, we we don't need a, a theory about why you know recognizing this word depends in these ways on these sound frequencies. There's there's no such thing. But if we're dealing with health, if we're dealing with public health. You know, we, we ask something more for, from our models. Um, we do want explanation. We do want not just out of sample prediction, but out of distribution prediction to be able to go to a different context. And we want, to, we want, to, we want models that are robust under intervention or under changes that are profound, like a new variant or like a new va you know, vaccination becoming available or, or um, a new therapeutic. Causal models give us that. Causal models like us take uh, ML machine learning models and use them in a causal way to predict under different contexts, to support some degree of explanation, to predict under intervention, to learn from data, and to predict. Um, and I might add dynamic models um, uh, have many of the same advantages. And in fact, these two are getting blurred in today's context. Um, both account for causal structure of the system. Causal models may pick up aspect of latent structure that can be analogized to the state of the system. Dynamic models may in involve some deduced structure. Um, and these two may, may be getting closer and closer together. 
With machine learning method, a company such as you will hear in spades about during this week, during this boot camp, you will see that you know, dynamic mechanistic models can absolutely learn from data and learn from it well. And they could be viewed as kind of within this broad, um, this broad area without drawing a strict line between them. They, they can be viewed as generative causal mo uh, machine learning models to a degree as well. So I would just you know, leave you with this, this thought that um, we're dealing with an evolution of machine learning towards this space in a way that really makes it so cognate to mechanistic models as to be very close. Um, um, now, for all these methods, I've glossed over a set of, of real challenges. Algorithmic bias these days is a real, you know, is a real challenge. Our models, particularly if they're not causal, they may build in associations that are, um, that, that build in bias to the algorithm in, in a normative sense and build in a, not just in a sense of an offset in the sense of, of real, real problems. They can, uh, you know, we may have participants who are selected because they have smartphones and we ignore participants who can't afford smartphones. Um, um, we may rely on data completeness that favors individuals um, who have the luxury of living a less, who are privileged and have less the luxury of living a less um, tumultuous life. Um, you know, ensuring privacy is a key need here. Generalizability, data quality, availability of theory, all of these are, are, are important issues. Ca causation versus correlation, we've, we've talked about um, there, but it cuts across all these traditions. I noted earlier a set of machine learning methods, traditions, and communities. And I, I want to emphasize that even if you were to predict you know, identify one of these methods. Um, how you how you treat data of a certain sort will differ. This is, for example, with latent Dirichlet uh, allocation, which is for analyzing text data. Deep learning would approach it in a different way, using different uh, different features. And and each of these um, makes use of kind of different formalisms. Deep learning these kind of deeper neural networks where we're training these connections for it to predict again and again and again. You may remember this idea of predicting Y given X. We're, we're training these connections so that this prediction is as good as possible. We're, we're keep on tuning it and tuning it and tuning it, having it learn until it can just nail this, this prediction process. Um, and and the types of data or that we're dealing with will shape, you know, what types of methods we use. If we're trying to do facial recognition, it'll be different than if we're trying to recognize coughs. If we're different from where we're using Reddit or Twitter data, um, or you know, managing video, recognizing video, or spatial temporal, uh, spatial ge geographic data or temporal data. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll just. Note some take home points. Time is, is uh, passing quickly here. Um, so machine learning is a collection of methods that allow algorithms to, to learn automatically and improve performance based on new data. The more data we give it, the better and better they can do at estimating those connections or finding those hidden structures, et cetera. They, they consume inordinate appetite. They have an inordinate appetite for data. They consume that and, and learn and identify structures or, or get better at predicting things. Um, and the need to secure insight from big data. Think about those wheels of everything that goes on in 60 seconds, for example, or types of health data that can come from social media, from from um, from smartphones or from from wastewater data or from administrative data or from health record data, making sense of this, securing insight, recognizing patterns in this is a is a key driver and enabler uh, for 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 machine learning. Um, health big data um, provides a valuable source of health insight, but you know, it's, it's, it's really a necessity in certain health spheres. Um, and we have to make sure it doesn't underplay those in, in marginal groups. But what I argued from this floor was that 
that in many cases, this sort of health big data, particularly in the areas of things like social media, um, uh, is also an important shaper of, of, of health behaviors, of health knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors. Uh, and, and that's important for understanding and, and, and thinking about as a driver, not merely as a variable to be observed from which we can collect data. It is both. It's, it's a reflection, it's a symptom and a cause. Um, uh, equity considerations in machine learning have ramifications across AI. Um, I noted that three big uses of machine learning is to describe, to predict, and predict in a way that reasons about and, and, and helps us challenge our assumptions about and checks the causal structure of the data generating process. And this idea of the data generating process, it sounds very, very, very airy, but it's, you know, it's about putting in places fixes that stay fixed. It's about coming to conclusions that, are, that will stay reliable. Um, and, and that's what we're seeking to do here with, with causal methods. Um, causal machine learning supports this sort of counterfactual reasoning and translation to other contexts and explanation, and really is getting very close to dynamic modeling methods. I view them as really meshing together increasingly um, and where methods in one can adapt from the others and we're, we're, we're evolving, um, we can foresee a, situ a future where they evolve jointly. Um, uh, depending on care to which, you know, they're used, big data machine learning can actually help us understand health disparities, but it can also risks deepening them. They can help understand them by understanding the impact of context, helping us understand what is shaping outcomes and recognize the causal factors of it, social determinants of health, for example. But if we're not careful, it can deepen them by privileging those who have the technologies for whom the data is readily available in a high quality fashion and um, investing in them at the expense of others in a way that will widen the gaps in health disparities, um, or widen the health disparities, the gaps between the health. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm a big believer in involving those with lived experience, community stakeholders, to help understand data. Um, uh, data, um, uh, data that's indicated that we, we collect um, can speak much fuller stories if we have um, the people represented um, uh, present um, to help us understand the data from whom the data was collected. Um, uh, and, and machine learning methods of this sort um, can aid in that. So I presented you a picture of the relationship between these. Uh, data science is broad collection of techniques, including methodologies and infrastructures and support mechanisms to help make sense of data, turn it into insights, particularly big data. Machine learning, which is used by other areas of artificial intelligence intensively, forms a key component of data science as well for rendering data into insight and particularly big data. Big data in health is of great significance. Um, it is one of those things that's not merely a luxury, but a necessity to deal with if we're dealing with issues such as those involving um, a youth mental health um, and increasingly adult mental health for interested in issues having to do with, um, uh, with people's health, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. We really can't take you know, big data off the table as a, as a key source of, of data. Um, and we need methods and they're, the types of methods talked about here to make sense of that big data. We're not gonna be able to do it with, with just traditional, um, traditional methods and we'll lose great insights by limiting ourselves um, and increasingly blind ourselves to some of the key driving factors. Um, data science is a rapidly evolving area and it has overlap with system science. These are not you know, just total total solitudes that are evolving separately. I've, I've argued uh, here in this morning that they're coming together really and aspects of machine learning 
are fusing with aspects of system science in, a, um, in an adherence to causal machine learning and causal learning uh, that can involve centrally the sort of system science techniques uh, joined with machine learning we're talking about this week. So I hope I haven't confused you too much, um, uh, but I've tried to bring out some basic features of that landscape um, that are going to complement our and, and synergize with our system science techniques. Um, having so done, I will um, stop sharing here and just ask if there's any questions people would like to ask, any, any factors people would like to discuss here. I'm not getting any questions in the in the chat here. Okay, not not yet. Um, is it possible to turn a prediction model into a causal model? That's a very good question. Um, um, so so I should have made it clear. Causal models are often, often we use causal models for prediction. But if I think what your question is, if we have a non-causal prediction model that we formulated ahead of time, like a, 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 a standard, you know, standard a, um, uh, a machine learning model is a prediction model, um, but it's not formulated causally, could we render it into a causal model? Um, Well, we could we could posit a, a, a certain causal structure based on its findings, and we could then, having posited that, we could challenge it with data and test the degree to which it's consistent with with the observations. Um, there are ways to to evaluate its potential fitness for this. But what would be often more fruitful would be to say, well, look, could we learn from that model and then postulate a certain causal structure that, that you know, takes into account some of those observations and then having postulated it, coming up with a certain causal structure, then estimate the strength of these causal connections using causal statistics approaches or causal machine learning approaches and, and find a prediction model that is inspired by some components of that, but where we're explicit about our causal assumptions and where we then estimate the strength of the causal driving relationships between these factors. And that could be readily done, but we can't just sort of take, uh, take that original model, that original estimated, uh, model and somehow transmogrify it into you know into a, a causal model that would be uh, that would be problematic um, there, because we have to start for most of the causal methods we have to start with positing a certain causal structure uh, we have to take a stance there and then we can test it out if it if it seems not unreasonable, we can then estimate its connections. Now, CCM, this approach, could also allow you to test, well, okay, so in your original model that you estimated, this highly predictive model, which of those connections um, stand up in the light of day as causal connections? Um, because CCM provides this way of taking time, particularly time series data, and scrutinizing it for, is this a causal relationship between these two or not? And those are based on system science principles, but it's a really powerful technique for asking, is this a causal connection um, based on dynamical systems theory? Um, 
Uh, I imagine machine learning and ABM can be useful in, in causal inference fields in epidemiology. Um, I referenced today a pearl. Um, there might be crosstalk between causal inference methods and system science. Absolutely. Um, uh, yes, uh, there's huge potential here. Unfortunately, you know, through sociological divides, you don't have many people crossing over that boundary. Um, I'm a big fan of that. And I think um, uh, causal inference methods and system science, again, start to approach each other in today's environment, particularly where we're engaging in causal, uh, causal methods, which, which pick up latent structure, kind of underlying structure, not directly observable, but which explains these patterns that we see. Um, I mean, that's what we're doing in system science in many ways is postulating causal latent structure that explains a system's behavior and typically be state of this system evolving over time. And that's getting very, very similar. So I, I, think, um, uh, I think there's going to be uh, real opportunities here, but it involves bringing together the, the communities to really have a, you know, fulsome discussion. Um, I think there's uh, large opportunities for doing that. And I think system science can benefit from it greatly in terms of, um, of working to help um, better challenge its, uh, its causal structural assumptions and better estimate them. And I think data science can learn from it through explicability, out of distribution prediction, in other words, translation to other contexts and recent male counterfactuals. So yeah, I think I think there's great, great potential here. Yeah, I think it's it's a matter of of the next generation uh, uh, helping to realize the bringing together of these these two worlds and having enough people that can cross over between them, speak speak the different languages to not be bowled over when they hear you know what's being spoken in the other. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, thank you uh, indeed. The, the multilingualism and, and, and translation and conceptual foundation, but I, I think here the, the, the concepts are closer. You're right that it's more the language, uh, I think. And, and we need, uh, we need uh, boldness in, in being able to speak the language of both sides, speak of the lingo. Okay, um, so, um, that was some some substantive um, material, and I admire your your patience with that. Um, we're going to take a break here. For uh, we're a bit overdue on a break here. Um, we're going to take a fifteen minute break. Um, so be back at fifteen past. Um, they'll place this about half an hour later. But I actually covered some material earlier that I was going to cover now, and so I'm I, I might be able to secure some economies, but um, we're also gonna get you going on a, on a hands-on exercise um, in a, a, a bit later this afternoon, which will hopefully add some uh, fun to the, uh, to the afternoon and, and complement the lectures. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, uh, regroup at, at 15 past. I'll look forward to seeing you then, thank you. <laughs>